Hello and welcome everyone to a new episode here at the War of the Rebellion podcast for a soul war. We are today going to what I as an Arkansas Razorback will not name as a university, but in the interest of my honored guest, Old Miss University in Northern Mississippi, the other Oxford, if you like, that we're going to. And Robert Colby and I will today talk about his new first book, which I think will not be eligible for the Center of Silver Research at Old Miss's um, first book, <laughs> Wiley Silver Book Prize, since he is working there. But it is an unholy traffic, slave trading in the Civil War South with Oxford University Press. Robert has a PhD from the University of North Carolina, spent a few years as a postdoc at Christopher Newport University, and is now part of what I already mentioned, the Center for Civil War Research at Ole Miss University. So, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time this morning for you to join oh, me to talk for about me. you in a book. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So tell me first, like, give me the origin story. How did this mm -hmm. book come about? Yeah, so so the origin story is basically I was I was in graduate school. Um, and uh, at the moment that I started graduate school, um, a number of books on the business of slavery, sla the sort of slavery and capitalism debates that were percolating in the in the early 2010s were um Sort of reaching their reaching their uh, highest points, um, and as I was reading, you know, books by Ed Baptist, Walter Johnson, and, and and so many of the other people writing on this topic, I it struck me that they largely that they they essentially ended when the Civil War began. Um, mm -hmm. the, you know, there might be a mention here and there um, in the in the epilogue of sort of a last gasp slave sale sort of thing. Um, and you know, I, I remember talking to one of my one of my committee members and, and saying something to the effect of, "Well, did did the slave trade happen during the Civil War?" And, and having this conversation, about, you know, I don't think anyone's ever looked at that. Um, and and I, I didn't expect to necessarily find that much, but we have a great art. We had a great archive at the University of North Carolina. The Southern Historical Collection is one of the best uh, collections of. Um, manuscripts from the from the pre-civil war south and so I, I started poking around and essentially i started finding example after example of transactions and enslaved people that occurred during the civil war um and i just decided that that was something that was worth pursuing um and so i, I you know i continued to dig and started to find some some really interesting commonalities amongst the transactions that I was finding. Um, and I guess close to 10 years later, we have a book. It does take time to get a book done. That's, it does. It does. Uh, that's some people saying it's very fast and easy work when the favorite author puts out a book every year, but that's not the reality for most of us. <laughs> Um, well, and, and the, the archives were, I would say the archives were mm -hmm. both um, a bit of a challenge in some ways, because there are very few large collections that, that pertain mm -hmm. to the slave trade during the Civil War. And so I mostly had to piece together the book from, this is sort of the paradox. On the one hand, the domestic slave trade during the Civil War is everywhere. Um, uh, and once you start looking for it, you will find it in in... Uh, I won't say almost every uh, collection of letters, but yeah. more than you would expect. And but it's often, you know, a single mention in a, in a collection of letters. Um, and so piecing together, uh, piecing together all of those uh, took quite some time. And I think I visited uh, at least thirty archives. Um, and uh, I, 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 I shudder to think of how many manuscript collections I looked at, but it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, a proverbial needle in a haystack. Exactly. Yeah, right. But you find a lot of needles if you look in enough haystacks. <laughs> yeah. And in your case, you definitely found a lot. Which yeah. actually, let's let's talk about this because I, I, I always find it curious because obviously we're talking here about people that 
by the very nature of slavery, aren't allowed to learn how to read and write. So they, in the moment of their enslavement, they can't give us a record of how do I feel, what's happening to me. So how do you get at their voices? How do you get at their experiences when you have to look at it through these transactional sources or through like like the white enslavers saying, yeah, I just sold a couple of slaves. You know, like how how do you get to them? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and I and I would say the answer is it is both very carefully, um, mm-hmm. and 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 I try very hard not to presume that I know the interior life of someone who you know can't who can't based on the archive for the most part pass on what he, what he or she is experiencing. So I, I, I try to be very careful. Um, that said, I think that there is a lot that you can glean um, through through a number of sources. Again, and all of these, of course, you have to be very careful with. But, um, you know, I, w- I was surprised, for example, at the number of enslaved people or, um, you know, recently liberated people I found speaking to journalists um, who, are, who are accompanying Civil War armies. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau records are are very rich in this area. Again, it's it's mediated, but it's um, may, maybe less mediated. Um, I did I did use the WPA narratives uh, as much as as much as I could. Um, again, treading lightly, but um, you know, uh, one one of the things that 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 surprised me as I was reading them is how many people experienced a transaction or lost a family member in a, in a moment that they could specifically date to the Civil War. You know, they would say mm-hmm. around the time of the surrender or just before, um, just before a specific army passed through an area. Or and and, and so, and, and again, because I think because those events were often so closely tied mm-hmm. to the moment of liberation, they, they law, I, I, at least I, I, I believe they lodged in people's memories. And, and I, I follow, um, you know, I, I try to adhere pretty closely to sort of best practices laid out by people like, um, the Volia Glimpse, Stephanie Jones Rogers in, in trying to be discerning, um, but also, um, you know, accepting of the testimony of, of people in the WPA narratives. Right. You know, I, I, that's, I was actually thinking as you were talking too, right? That's the challenge of like when you when you have that traumatic moment of mm-hmm. like your son gets sold away, and then a week later Sherman's army marches through, it that like you're still grieving, and then something happens like you know mm-hmm. it's like when, mm-hmm. when we say like everyone remembers when nine eleven happens where they were, and that's mm-hmm. probably exactly the mm-hmm. same kind of psychological situation we have with right. enslaved narratives there. Right. And it provides, and, and again, it, it provides sort of a chronological anchor yeah. that you can sort of, you know, that, that, that I, th- that I, at least I believe people um, were able to sort of date things around even, you know, 60, 70 years later. Um, the only, the only thing I would say is um, on the, on this is, as, as I said, I, I, tr- I try very hard not to presume to understand what people were thinking or feeling in a given moment. Mm-hmm. But that said, um, I, I do think that careful work in the archives that enslavers uh, left behind, uh, especially when combined with with narratives, with other testimony, with, you know, Freedmen's Bureau records and things like that, um, at, at a minimum, you can. Uh, it is possible to reconstruct something of the of the material experience mm-hmm. that people that people had, and so uh, that that's something that I try to do where possible um, to sort of build as as careful and as detailed a picture of at least the physical and sort of um, material experience that people had. Um, without again, without presuming to be able to totally reconstruct their mental uh, and emotional states. Yeah, I mean, we can't. <laughs> it's, that's where we historians, right? We 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 don't right. have that ability, uh, right? Let's change gear a little bit because I'm I'm pretty sure most people that listen to this will be familiar with some of what the slave trade looks like. But just give us a little sense of like what what was the trade like in in sort of mm-hmm. the antebellum, and then maybe into like how does it change as a war breaks out? Very kind of not. The Cliff Note version. 
Sure. Um, so yeah, so so the Cliff Notes version of the domestic slave trade, um, and there, you know, there are any number of excellent books on this. Um, Walter Johnson, I already mentioned, Ed Baptist, uh, Joshua Rothman published a great book on on the largest slave trading firm in American history, Franklin and Armfield, a few years ago. Um, and Alexandra Finley uh, has a has a, a great book on um, sort of the interior lives of of women ensnared in the slave trade. Um, so there's a lot of great work uh, that that focuses on on the domestic slave trade, and and I, I, I would encourage people to to read that. Um, the short version is essentially the, the domestic slave trade emerges in mostly in the decades following the American Revolution um, to move enslaved people from. The, primarily from the Upper South, Virginia, Maryland, um, Kentucky, North Carolina, to the sort of booming cotton and sugar frontiers of the Lower South, uh, essentially from places where enslaved people can be used less profitably to the places where they can be move, used more profitably. Um, we don't have an exact number of how many people experience this, Um Estimates range from a, a few hundred thousand to as high as a million. Um, the the best numbers uh, that I've seen are probably somewhere between six and eight hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it, it, it's a significant movement. Um, Michael Tadman suggests that probably two thirds of all the people moved from the upper to the lower South were done, moved through the slave trade. Um, mm -hmm. That is, someone buying them in a place like. Mm -hmm. Baltimore or Richmond or Charleston and selling them in Natchez or New Orleans or mm -hmm. uh, any of the many slave markets that dot the South. Um, the uh, how people move changes uh, over the 19th century um, from sort of smaller scale uh, individual, uh, you know, uh, a slave trader will accumulate 20 to 40 people um, mm -hmm. in a city often march them over land a journey of of six weeks to six to ten weeks um from say again from say richmond to natchez um so people will move across tennessee across mississippi um in 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 modest sized groups that grows as the 19th century passes um there's also a large number of people moved by sea um from ports like baltimore norfolk charleston savannah to Mobile, New Orleans, eventually Galveston. Um, and so there, 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 there are lots of different ways that people move. Um, but it's but fundamentally, it's a mass movement of people from the Upper South to the Lower South, simply because um, the economics of cotton and sugar make it extremely profitable to use enslaved people's labor in those fields. And um, the projected value of their labor puts a price on them that can be exploited by professional slave traders. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, like two questions that follow from that. Like the first sure. one I'm going to like, like, obviously I'm very interested in the international side of the civil war period. Mm -hmm. And I forget when exactly the case was, but we had like one time a slave trader is that was engaged in the domestic trade that drifted over into the Bahamas and it created mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. kinds of controversies. Now, during mm -hmm. the Civil War, we have to blockade. So I would assume yes. coastal trade is totally shut down. They can't move anyone by mm -hmm. boat, right? So, yeah. So I have found, I have found almost no evidence of people being transported along the coasts um, <sighs> during the Civil War. Um, in fact, you know, I, I I found this an account, for example, of of a handful of slave sales that take place in New Orleans because the blockade mm -hmm. trapped uh, a slave trader in the city, um, mm. and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't get out. Right. Get out. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I found, and and I think that um, as I'm sure we'll talk about, a lot of the slave trading that happens during the Civil War is about balancing risk. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's extremely risky to take craft out uh, with the various um, Union, especially as the war progresses, but as the Union, there are Union naval squadrons blockading the major slave trading ports. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've seen almost no evidence of the coastwise slave con continuing during the Civil War. That's what I thought. I was kind of just curious yeah. about that, that. I'm not crazy about it, but yeah, good. No, um, and 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 but you're right. There there are there's there's a lot of great work done on the coastwise slave trade, especially um, 
where uh, either slave rebellions or wrecks send ships to the Bahamas um, yes. and create. Um, Jeffrey Kerr Ritchie has a has a really good book on this. I think Jeff Forrett is working on something as well. Um, yeah, there there are some. There's it's real. It's really fascinating. Oh God, yeah. It, it just like the domestic also becomes international, and then mm-hmm. you get Britain involved, and the Bahamas as an odd place involved, and it's just mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> It, it becomes really odd very fast. Now, the other part with regard to moving was, I was thinking railroads. How much do they use railroads for mm-hmm. this? And how do you move if you do enslave people on the railroads? Like, I, mm-hmm. I would assume you're not putting them into a passenger car. <laughs> do you put them into like a like like an animal car? Or where, where do you put them? How do you do yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, the details are a little spotty. Okay. Um, uh, that is to say, I, they don't tell the, you the so they're, they're, nuts and bolts. I, yeah, I don't. So I, I have not seen, for example, a lot of sort of specific, I mean, let's say a bill of lading for right. how enslaved mm-hmm. people are transported along the rails. I, I know that it happens. Um, there are, there <laughs> are, uh, slave traders letters are, are replete with references to sending people through the cars mm-hmm. a, as they usually call them. Um, and this this is pretty common starting in the 1840s. Um, Fred, mm-hmm. uh, not Frederick Douglass. Um, Charles Dickens, for example, comments on seeing enslaved people moved along mm-hmm. the railroad running between um, Richmond and Washington D.C. when he visits the United States in the early 1840s. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that that does have it uh, that's it becomes much more common in the late 1840s and 1850s. Um, okay. There are um, uh, it's hard to say exactly which cars enslaved people move in. Um, sometimes in standard passenger cars, certainly uh, white travelers regularly reference seeing people sent for sale. Um, okay. You know, uh, I've, I've been reading um, Ilion Wu's uh, reconstruction of William and Ellen Craft's book. Uh, some, oh. some trains certainly have cars, mm-hmm. uh, certainly have cars devoted for enslaved people's passage and and i i'm I'm sure that that's a major um i'm sure that's where most of the people sent for sale travel um that said one of the challenges then is oversight um i've seen i've i've seen references to enslaved people sent along a railroad who you know jump from moving trains for example to to escape and so um that's something that 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 slave traders or enslavers sending people along the rails do balance um, mm. yeah that's that's curious like that's a moment where you wish somebody would actually like you know like like tell us the thought process tell us like in more mm-hmm. detail <laughs> how mm-hmm. this is done just yeah. kind of satisfy our curiosity i i tell you just one one example that, that stood out from the research i was doing uh, this is in the fall of 1862 um mm-hmm. a british traveler who was working his way up from new orleans to to richmond notes that he is traveling alongside a uh, i assume a professional slave trader but someone who has bought about 20 enslaved people and is taking them to richmond for sale and mm-hmm. then shortly thereafter there in a completely other diary actually a diary of a confederate officer he talks about how he's he's leaving richmond he's he, he had been captured i think he's returning to his unit if i recall correctly um and he's leaving richmond also in a car full of enslaved people purchased for sale so you yeah. know even during yeah. the civil war uh when confederate rolling stock is pretty is pretty is in pretty high demand um the yeah. confederate rail system is increasingly rickety certainly enslaved people are still being moved along railroad lines um within the confederate interior wow it it, it sort of raises like that larger point that you already hinted at that kind of prioritization right of like mm-hmm. like a mm-hmm. yes there's risk in all of this but there's also like the priorities like you can't get cotton out. You can't get sugar out. You can't get right. rice or indigo or any of these cash crops out. Like your your plantation is like, what do you do with your plantation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like, then there's your labor force. What do you do with your right. labor force? <laughs> so it's like, what goes through a planter's mind? Like, do I sell? Do I keep the sla- enslaved people? What do I best mm-hmm. do? Like it, I was actually thinking more in terms of like it's it's almost a betting game that you're engaging. It is. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it it absolutely is. Um, and you know, when when you're talking about how these decisions are made, I, I think they're highly individualized. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, and, and and completely dependent, or not completely, but heavily dependent on local circumstances. Um, mm. So, for example, uh, if you if, if if slaveholders who are who are in the Confederate interior sheltered, relatively sheltered from Union invasions, mm-hmm. have, have a completely different calculus than someone in, for example, the South Carolina Sea Islands. Um, yeah. Or, you know, in sort of the, you know, the, the South Carolina Valley. low country. Yeah, or the Mississippi, exactly, the Mississippi River Valley. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that was really fascinating is just uh, as I read through, you know, the collections and slavers left of their papers watching the decision making calculus play out um yeah. and uh so so for example um you know people people in let's say central alabama um mm-hmm. i would say their calculus is much more uh, it's all uh, there there are a number of factors that play in um including how uh but the two big ones i would say are how uh, how likely do you think the Confederacy is to win the Civil War, and how close are you to the uni- to the Union Army? Um, mm. And if you think the Confederacy is going to win the Civil War, and you're far from the Union Army, you are sl- slaveholders who who have those con- who meet those conditions are much more likely to sort of stand pat um, mm-hmm. to to try to retain their enslaved labor force. Um, and to wait for, you know, wait for victory in better times to, to, okay. to reemerge. Um, the, they might, those are also people who tend to try to augment their enslaved labor mm-hmm. forces by buying people during the war. Again, um, betting that they win and bet, yeah, and then... it, exactly. Right. And, and, you know, uh, and this surprised me when I first started seeing it until I started Ooh. trying, until I, I started seeing the various logics at play here. Um, and, and there oh. are a couple. Um, one is that, you know, uh, if you look at just the numbers, the prices offered for enslaved people had climbed steadily for 15 years and before the civil war and slaveholders assume that's going to basically pick right back up when, when they, when they win and establish an independent slaveholding Republic, um, so sort of when like they a stock restore, investment, right. That you exactly. expect the stock to keep rising. So I'm going to buy and hopefully, and. Five years, I can right. sell it a, or, a profit, right? Or to, to to borrow to borrow that language, right? Um, people talk about in sort of contemporary investing buying the dip, right? So yep. if a stock temporarily drops, but you think it's going to go up in the long term, you buy, and that's exactly what large numbers of slaveholders do during the war. They say, "Look, I know enslaved people might not be worth that much right now." But when the war is over, they're going to be worth two thousand, three thousand. I've seen numbers as high as five or six thousand yeah. um, dollars, and so they're they're buying in anticipation of those those prices continuing to rise. Um, the other the other part that really matters here um, is sort of the the inverse of that. Um, you know, the Confederate economy is an absolute catastrophe. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we all know this, right? Um, yeah. there, there's a reason Confederate money is still shorthand for something that's not that that's fake or, you know, not good. Yeah. Um, and that dictates an enormous amount of, uh, that, that dictates an enormous number of slaveholders decisions. Um, the speed with which they lose faith in Confederate mm-hmm. money is really something to behold. Um, and the, the, the currency problems are a challenge that they they try to navigate throughout the entire war. And so basically what you have is um, people looking at and, and, and I should let me let me let me say they don't a lack of faith in Confederate money does not translate into a lack of faith in the Confederate project. Right. Um, they compare themselves repeatedly to the american revolutionaries and they say look continental money was worthless but the united states did just fine in the end right Mm -hmm. um but what they what what many of them know or many of them believe is that if they have cold confederate paper money or they buy confederate bonds they kind of think the confederacy is going to repudiate their bonds or or the money is not going to be worth anything so what they're looking for is a what we would you know what we would call a real asset in which to store the the paper money that they have on hand and mm-hmm. 
you know, they have they have a couple of options. Um, you know, a lucky few are able to buy hard currency, but there's just not that much of it in the Confederacy. Um, and most of what they have goes abroad pretty quickly oh. to to buy war material. Yeah. Um, so what you're left with is essentially uh, you can you can you can you can place your bet on Confederate bonds if you really want to, and some people certainly do. Um, but you're left with kind of the three nodes of the cotton economy. Uh, cotton, land, or enslaved people. Um, Confederates invest in all of these, but the they all have different drawbacks. Um, mm-hmm. Land is not portable. No. Uh, and frankly, neither is cotton uh, in, in the sort of quantity you would need to invest in. Um, so what a lot of, what, what a large number of Confederates choose is people. They, they invest their money in people. Um, the main drawback with people being people can escape, right. Um, or, uh, you know, can their freedom and will when the war's do. over. Uh, exactly. Um, and so, so the, you know, sort of the major problem with, um, you know that that's sort of the major consideration, but you know I have I have lodged in my brain an early letter that I a letter I read and and frankly that that really transformed my my thinking on the project. Um, I was reading a letter at the Virginia well what's now the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and it was a conversation between a, a Confederate soldier and his father-in-law, basically talking about so how do we come out of the war in good financial condition and what the son-in-law says is look the if you believe we're going to win the only smart investment you can make is in enslaved people because mm-hmm. they're the only thing that'll hold their they'll hold their value uh they'll appreciate after the war and and the, the, the but the line that's lodged in my brain is he says he, he basically says yeah if we lose they will be worth nothing uh, but and, and and again it's it's seared into my brain he says um but i do not like i do not even like entertain that thought um, and even if I did, it's well worth the risk. Like, I won't let myself think about this because I don't, I, you know, because I, I can't comprehend a world in which we lose. But even if that were a possibility, it's worth the risk to acquire yeah. enslaved people. I mean, it's, it's sad to think that we're talking human beings here being used yeah. like, oh, yeah, like stock or like mm-hmm. uh, an investment mm-hmm. or like a currency. But yeah. it's, it's that's what they were kind of doing at the time. Now, one thing that I noticed you you do mention a few times throughout the book, like the prices of of people, enslaved people being mm-hmm. sold. Mm-hmm. And um, if I kind of crept my chronology as I read through it correct, as the war continues, the prices continue to go up. Now, how much is that because of the inflation and the mm-hmm. value yeah. of the Confederate currency versus yes. an actual kind of increase in the price. It's it is it's heavily driven by inflation. Um, okay. I mean that's what I saw. At the end of the yeah, so by I mean so by the end of the war, what you have you have you have people selling for five, six, even seven thousand. Yeah, I, like that was crazy. <laughs> Yes. And that is that is almost entirely inflation talking Mm. um, for a variety of reasons. Um, And and again, uh, you could you could ask the question and and, and I think it's worth considering. So if, you know, the Confederacy experiences, I think, 7000 percent inflation um, over the course of the war. So, you know, Mm. if you're talking about seven thousand dollars in 18 in like the by at the end of the war is the equivalent of i think about a hundred dollars in gold Mm -hmm. you're not you're really not talking i you can certainly make the case that enslaved people are not worth very much at the very end of the war and i think that's probably true Mm -hmm. um i think by but that's really only I, i would say that's really only the case at the in the last you know post post the election of 1864, post the fall of Atlanta. Um, that's the only point at which I would say that the value really falls out of the bottom of enslaved people. Um, because that's when emancipation is is almost, but not entirely, right, almost inevitable. Um, mm-hmm. But you always have what I would say to the end. 
right? Yeah, that, right. I mean, so so you know, I, I I think there's a South Carolina soldier who um, is writing in January 1865 to a member of his family and saying, "Look, you should try to get your hands on enslaved people because, yeah, if we lose, they'll be worth nothing, but if we win, they'll be worth." And he says a thousand. That's probably an exaggeration, but they'll be worth a thousand times what they are now. Um, right. And 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 there's not there, there's nothing else that's comparable as an asset. Um, it looms, you know, the threat of confiscation looms over all forms of property. Mm-hmm. Um, Confederates are not sure what's going to happen. Um, as early as 1862, uh, yeah. D.H. Hill writes to his wife and says, "The only, you know, said, it basically write, writes to his wife, warning her and sort of advising her on investments because, and, and that's shaped by." he assumes everything will be confiscated by the, at the end of the war. Um, And so there is sort of a, there's an ambivalence born of, I think, desperation at the end of Mm -hmm. the war. Um, But it is, it is sort of shocking to see. And, and, you know, um, no one has written better on diehard rebels than Jason Phillips, but you see that sort of spirit born out, even, even in sort of the, the remainder of the slave market at the end of the war. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned in your books that sales actually picked up there in uh, late 64, early 65 a little bit. You know, the, the evidence is really hard to pin down. Uh, what I can tell you is that so for I have I have an account book from a, sl- a slave trader in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, which is a protected part or relatively Shattered. protected part of the Confederacy. Um, yeah, it gets, you know, it gets raided and, and eventually burned. But yeah. Um, his his sales remain relatively steady and into the winter uh, of 1864-65. That is to say, he's selling about 20 people per month. Uh, mm-hmm. There there's a brief there's a brief dip, um, which mostly is related to um, Confederate Confederate efforts at currency reform, I believe, um, mm-hmm. yeah. and it kind of yeah. just kind of ticks along uh, at a pretty steady clip. Um, yeah. Real prices, right? The the actual sort of standardized price continues to drop, but um, I, I I and I think that's material that matters. Um, but I think what's I think it's more telling that people continue to buy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like I mean, it's, it's I mean, we could make a modern day comparison with a certain stock right now, and people are buying, even though you're kind of yeah, like, why I mean, would you buy that stock? Well, and the, you're right. And is, you know, right. Is it, is it ideological? Is right. it uh, a long-term bet? It's, and, and can you, I mean, one of the things I think, uh, you know, I, I think about, I've thought about a lot in writing this book is to what degree can you actually parse those things? Um, right. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure you certainly with, um, with the purchase and sale of enslaved people during the war, I, I think it's very difficult to, um, it's very difficult to separate ideology and, right. um, economic yeah. expectations well yeah i mean you're like we said earlier you're betting on the victory of a country mm-hmm. born to protect mm-hmm. slavery so <laughs> of course you and and, and i should and, and i should mention you're right that this is this makes some sense uh there there is a great article by jonathan pritchett and charles calamiris that charts um the the purchase and sale of enslaved people throughout the um Throughout the sectional crisis, starting in the late 1840s up through, mm. um, they 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 track it up through the beginning of the Civil War, and right. you know uh, the the they suggested that you know the various things you know when we teach the U.S. history survey and the coming of the Civil War, none of those events have any material effect on the slave market. Oh. Um, nothing until Lincoln's Lincoln's election has a material effect on the slave market. And I would argue that that's not really, and I I would argue, I do argue in the book that, you know, even the dip you see in the slave market following Lincoln's election, and it's very real, it's significant. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's more of a sort of broader economic issue. Um, You see an extraordinary amount of people talking about how, uh, there's there's no money, no credit. They they, they simply Ooh. can't buy enslaved people, right. um, rather than a lack of confidence in slavery. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, now to turn this around a little bit, because like we're we're talking a lot about confidence, like speculation mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Slave enslaved people are an investment. They are valuable. And what do you do when it's like? 
let's say Mississippi as an example, since that's where you are, mm-hmm. Grand's army is marching in, and mm-hmm. you're in the path of that army. What do you do? Do you, you do you move your slaves? Do you can mm-hmm. you move your slaves in time? Like, do you try and mm-hmm. sell? What what do you do in this mm-hmm. kind of emergency situation? Yeah, I would say all of the uh, slaveholders try all of the above. Um, <laughs> there is, uh, you know, I um, certainly many people can and do try to refugee enslave people out of the way. Um, either to there, there are there are large numbers of people go from uh, if you're on the um, eastern bank of the Mississippi, a large number of people go to Alabama. Okay. Um, those on the western bank to Arkansas and, and eventually to Texas. Um, right. Uh, you know, um, uh, if people who have read the diary of Kate Stone, for example, see this at play, um, Kayla McDaniel's, uh, recent book, uh, describes this process as well. Um, and certainly, uh, I'd either, but also there are people who don't flee, but se- or sell or try to sell people out of the way of the oncoming <laughs> union army. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I we could talk about any number of examples of that. I, I remain particularly struck by a man who wrote to Jefferson Davis uh, saying that he had lost a large number of people to Union forces around Vicksburg. And he had, he had fled with those he retained to Alabama, where he planned to buy more people, um, you know, um, but Don't so. Give up. so and, and, Right, right. Well, that's the thing, right? Again, it's it, it's the the sort of the the persistence of this desire to acquire people is is real is is I think in in many ways the the most uh, once I started to find that that's where I knew I had a project basically. Yeah. Um, the, it's the like a, and it's I would almost say like that, the addiction of gambling, right? Of like I I have to keep mm-hmm. buying, I have to keep going, mm-hmm. I I can't stop because if I if I stop, I stop believing in the cause of the Confederacy. Yeah. I think I think I think there's something to that. Um, and again, to the degree that people stop, yeah, certainly there are people who are are you know worn down by the mm-hmm. conflict. Um, yeah. But I think it has a lot more to do with the economic mechanisms breaking mm-hmm. down um, than anything else. Um, yeah. this, I, the only thing I would say is that that you but, but what you're describing absolutely it happens all around the Confederate perimeter wherever Union forces arrive. Um, yeah. There is a the, a wave of ens- <clears throat> excuse me a wave of enslaved people move away from them. Um, some of those people are sold, some of them are moved, uh, and um, enslavers try to hire them out in various places. Um, mm-hmm. John B. Jones, the the Confederate war clerk who led left a famous diary, talks about. He says, you know, there's scarcely a train, you know, train loads of people essentially are arriving in Richmond from exposed parts of the state. Um, mm-hmm. Some of those people go into the slave market. Some of those people get hired out um, yeah. by by enslavers. Um, it's really sort of a calculate, it, like you say, it's it's it, it's it's slaveholders making risk calculations uh, in mm-hmm. in every direction. Basically, um, there are also people, though, to come back to the the point we were just discussing, who s- absolutely see this as an opportunity. Um, I read numerous accounts from from slaveholders, uh, many of them from Confederate soldiers, riding home to relatives, saying, "You know, if you get down here near where the action is, near where fi- no, the fighting is happening, you can buy enslaved people really cheaply." Because uh, local slaveholders are trying to get rid of them. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, There's a, I think a lot about, there's a letter that goes to a Richmond slave trader named E.H. Stokes from a a doctor in Eastern North Carolina. And the doctor basically says, if you give me $10,000, I can buy a lot of people and we can make a lot of money doing that. Um, And so, you know, that this is, um, again, we think of this as sort of, a story of emancipation and it very much is in mm-hmm. many ways but it, there's 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 a dark side to this yeah. um that goes beyond even the sort of usual dark side that we yeah. think of of the the deeply uneven treatment mm-hmm. enslaved people receive in union lines right. um and in, in in refugee camps mm-hmm. uh but even beyond that there there are the experiences of the people who are sold away from freedom um mm-hmm. And and there are I, I I you know I certainly I certainly think thousands of people who experience that. Yeah, no, that's the dark side of it all. 
is there uh, so what when you were talking the one part that i was struck by and i don't think it's in your book but it's sort of like okay let's say you're a slaveholder in like mississippi and you move your slaves mm -hmm. and slave people to alabama you're in, mm -hmm. in coastal alabama you feel threatened you move into the interior mm -hmm. you're in tennessee and the Union Army, U.S. Army is approaching, and you're moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I, I get you're you're wanting to protect your your assets here, but what do you do with like we're, yeah. we're, we're increasing the population in an area of the Confederacy that is mm -hmm. more safe, but there's not mm -hmm. much more work here. Like, no, <laughs> it's like are, like it it's almost like we're sending more people into an area. But there's nothing they can do there, right? Um, and and I will say this is this is a real challenge that slaveholders run into. Um, yeah. uh, there, you know, the you you, in addition to the obstacles you mentioned, there are also, uh, you know, someone presumably owns most of the land into which you would move, right? And so. Um, what ha this is this is something enslavers struggle with uh who are refugeeing people um if from you know from texas to from texas to virginia basically this is this yeah. is a persistent problem um I, I would say a couple of things um one is that this is some this 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 often leads to um even in even, let's say even enslavers who had been reluctant to sell who wanted to retain mm -hmm. enslaved people under their control when they arrive in a place and realize there's there's limited options for work or there's not land available right. that often produces a set of sales um okay. they can't they can't maintain people they can't control mm -hmm. people there's nowhere right. on which to work them uh that often produces a set of sales either to sort of raise immediate money to maintain the people a slaveholder is retaining or to simply, you know, offload what they understand to be a burden. Um, oh. uh, they're also, and that's the even even further, right? Um, enslaved people do not like this. Uh, enslaved yeah. people, um, especially, you know, if uh, I, I'm thinking of another example of, of slaveholders who fled from the Natchez area into Alabama. And they, you have all these letters in 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 their papers saying, "What are we going to do? Like, we can't, we can't, we don't have the money to feed the people we've brought here. We don't have any land on which to grow crops, or it's the wrong time of year in which to grow crops." Um, yeah, yeah. And 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 the people we refugeed are getting restless, and and it's yeah. becoming dangerous. Um, yeah. And so, in in those cases, you often see people sold away. Um, yeah. The other op one of the one of the other options I should say, um, and this is w the is the um, the option provided by the Confederate military effort, mm -hmm. um, and so one of the one thing that does fill some of the vacuum, depending on where you are, um, mm -hmm. is the Confederate the Confederate government, the Confederate effort to to maintain and equip and field its armies requires an enormous amount of labor. Um, mm -hmm. And as the war goes on, more and more of that labor is done by enslaved people. Uh, I, by the end of the war, the commonly cited figure is 80 percent of the middle, uh, military aged men in the Confederacy are, are in the service. Mm -hmm. And the, the labor that they would otherwise have done is is done in large part by enslaved people. And so um, enslaved people work in large numbers on Confederate infrastructure projects, uh, building fortifications and. Um, and in manufacturing, producing um, armaments, producing iron, uh, digging coal, mining nitre to make gunpowder, um, making clothes for the Confederate military. All, all of these things require enslaved labor. A lot of that labor is hired. Uh, mm -hmm. That is to say, um, you know, if you are... If, by the the famous Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, uh, mm -hmm. now home to the American Civil War Museum, uh, had always hired enslaved laborers. They've been doing that since right. the 1840s. Um, but whereas they might have hired 50 uh, in the antebellum period, they are hiring six, seven, eight hundred people during the Civil War. Um so a lot uh, there, there clearly is um mm -hmm. they're clearly they're clearly getting most of this labor by renting people which allows 
enslavers to retain control of them and mm-hmm. sort of minimizes the long-term exposure of the firm. Mm-hmm. That said, there is definitely a market in enslaved people to do this military labor for the um for the Confederacy. And that's particularly um particularly true for skilled well I mean what we would call skilled enslaved laborers. Um uh, I know that there there are scholars who would argue a much broader spectrum of labor than we usually think of as skilled is in fact skilled labor. Um, but I'm thinking particularly of people with experience in manufacturing. Um, so for example, Tredegar hires a large number of people to do, to do its work, but in a number of cases, they outright purchase, for example, people with specific experience in the iron industry. Um, because they want, because those people are particularly valuable to their operations. Mm -hmm. I I don't, I don't have evidence to support this, but maybe that would be, those would be people they want to retain after the war. Um, but I think the critical thing is, um, if you hire someone, you have limited control over their labor, but if you buy someone outright, you, you're not in competition with someone else for it. Um, and so, um, uh, iron firms like Tredegar buy a large number of people, as do um, coal mines, uh, are particularly dangerous. Mm-hmm. And enslavers are reluctant to hire people to coal mines because the work is so deadly. Um, coal mines purchase people to do work during the war. Mm-hmm. And um, railroads purchase a significant number of people to to, to work during the war or um yeah, they allocate hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases to acquiring enslaved laborers during the war. So that is that is one option that is available to um, enslavers who are looking, you know, who are looking around and saying, I, I have nowhere to work these people that I retain. Yeah. Well, and it's it's I was going to ask about that at some point, too, as we mm-hmm. were, t- we're going to talk, because it, it's so often forgotten that. I mean, the Confederacy is one of the most industrialized nation states mm-hmm. in in the world mm-hmm. during the Civil War. I mean, they are sure they it's not on the same level as Britain or France, but they are working on it, and we have mm-hmm. that as it, Jim Octonet and they do it very quickly. Says, military industrial complex, right? And they are doing it fast. Right. Mm-hmm. That transition and and. And part of the reason that they do it so quickly is that they can they can mobilize enslaved labor to make it happen. You have the labor force right there that you can use. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I did want to ask though so because I, I forget I I don't think it was you but at at a conference presentation I one time was in a person talked about insurance rates because when a mm-hmm. when a enslaver rents out slaves to like a coal mine or a railroad building project they usually take out insurance for this for the person mm-hmm. because they kind of like again they're looking at it as an asset like we insure mm-hmm. our cars so they insured they're enslaved in case an accident happened that slave gets injured or killed so that they get money back was it still possible during the civil war that you could get insurance and was it like i guess was it yeah worth it because like of the inflation and everything it's a great question. Um, I have, I've seen very little evidence about insurance purchased on enslaved people during the civil war. Um, and you know, frankly, it was not, my understanding is that it was not enormously common before the war. It certainly happened, but it was sort of, uh, done in specific circumstances okay. let's say uh where where enslavers felt themselves to be particularly exposed by a certain type mm-hmm. of work or um you know i i've read correspondence among slave traders for example who say who will write you know you're headed to new orleans and it's yellow fever season so you should insure <laughs> the people you're taking there um i mean you know uh. it's, it's it's yeah but it's one of, and it's one of those like sort of stunning things that just yeah. makes you contemplate the horror of the whole thing right um totally but uh i you know i i've seen almost no evidence and i don't know if that would be because you know i i could you know if i were speculating as to why is it because there's less access to the sort of resources required to ensure someone um Mm. is it because there's just so much risk during the civil war that no one will ensure 
enslaved right. people. Um, okay. The closest thing I'll say, the closest thing I've seen is actually in um, contracts between individual slaveholders for okay. the the purchase and sale of people. So, um, you know, there will be specific clauses, for example, saying, look, we're in a war. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee this person, for example, in case they flee. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, or I, you know, one of the more remarkable, the ones that I saw, I think, I think it was from the Shenandoah Valley, if I recall mm-hmm. correctly. Um, two slaveholders make a contract uh, for for the sale of a person, mm-hmm. and they say basically there is too much chaos going on for us to decide what the fair what a fair price would be right now. So we'll figure this out after the war. Basically, um, <laughs> we will we will agree on a fair price after the war because everything is just too uncertain for us to do it right now. Um, now that's not common. Question. Did they see... ever agree to a price? Because after uh, the... oh man, I I wish I knew. Um, I wish that I knew would what be that conversation so looked like. Amazing document. Uh, th- there are amazing. I would say there are amazing court cases after the Civil War. Oh, where um, so so. You know, when 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 a person per when a when a slaveholder purchased an enslaved person, they often essentially paid in installments. Um, oh, and uh, so, yeah, so there are all, there's a wave of cases after the Civil War, and and Amanda Kleintop is, has written on these a bit um, of essentially people trying to use the fact of emancipation and the Thirteenth Amendment to get out of pain enslaved people and and the court rulings are sort of all over the place on this eventually Mm. the 14th amendment has has an effect on them um but it's uh it's really something to watch sort of the the mental uh gymnastics that people undertake to um you know to say well look you know uh, you can't expect me to pay for continue to pay for an enslaved person when slavery no longer exists even though they entered into that contract in sort of good faith um so yeah it's uh it's the there are there are just all kinds of of remarkable rabbit holes you can go down in oh, yeah. in exploring this and and you find just the the most bizarre things yeah wow <laughs> that's just blows your mind right like mm-hmm. it war's does over and slavery is ended but you still have to untangle the web that that I'm, that institution left. Uh, so, so, um, you know, I, I came across a collection, um, you know, li- list, those listening may be familiar with uh, the story of Callie House, for example, and the the sort of ex-slave association trying to get pensions for, for formerly mm-hmm. enslaved people. But um, there are also uh, at least theoretically movements alive to get compensation for slaveholders. Yeah, uh as well after the civil war again this is something amanda kleintop writes about far more than i do but i will say i came across a document from the 1890s where a slaveholder is is basically um the, there, there was an organization created that said that allegedly was going to lobby congress for compensation for slaveholders and it it was eventually uh the postal the postal service eventually investigated it as a fraud um Mm -hmm. again much like they did cali house uh but i found interest former slaveholders who were interested in this idea as late as the mid 1890s um wow so it does not go away right this this hold is this this still exercises a hold on people Sort of like you, you want to scream at some of like, didn't you read Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation? He kind of said, yeah. "Come back, and you can keep your property." Right? You didn't want to listen, it, you know? So. Yeah, right. Um, and I, yeah, it, it is. I, I one of the things that I sort of find, continue to find remarkable is that you know the border state slaveholders never, never even seriously consider compensated emancipation, as right. as best I can tell. Yeah. Um, and yeah, um, I, I, I did my, I did my undergraduate work with, with Gary Gallagher and one of the, one of the, one of the things he he hammered into us and in which I have, I've tried to maintain throughout this project, right. Is that, yes, we know what's going to happen, but they don't, 
Um, yeah. And you have to read all of this going forward. You have to read mm-hmm. all the evidence, you know, going forward rather than looking back. Um, yeah. But I, I will admit that there are there are documents like that 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 shake my ability to do that. Yeah. No, I, I can see that, and it's it's hard because we know the outcome. That's our mm-hmm. that's our big benefit. Mm-hmm. We know what's happening, mm-hmm. and uh, it it's it's tough then to kind of put yourself in that moment and be like, no, I can't project forward yet of what will actually happen i need to take them at their word (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, my gosh um oh goodness um let's briefly like because we're we're kind of talking so much about like the internal instability really of the confederacy and uh, in, in many ways, when I was reading through some of the sections in your book and kind of the worry that comes with like this large population of sl- enslaved people moving about, the like, threat of, of emancipation, of potentially rebellion, of like what, what will happen mm-hmm. here, um, even, even just sort of like the, you know, like the, the internal conflict between slaveholders and non-slaveholders, it, it, it very much reminded me of sort of the William Freelings's old book on the South versus the South, even though he doesn't like explicitly talk about the slave trade as part of this, but mm-hmm. it, it kind of feels like you're adding to the sort of notion of these many different Souths, regionally different people groups that are fighting internally about what's the meaning of this new confederacy will be. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, certainly what I would say is, um, you know, uh, one of the things that Freeling is so good on in that book is that, um, you know, uh, enslaved people are Southerners, too. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, and I think that that's something that that I think comes through in my book. Uh, and, you know, I recalls, you know, um Stephanie McCurry's work as well in in the ways that um, Confederates are forced to reckon with people they had planned on not reckoning with. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so I think, I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, I would say, um, and, and and the slave trade, I would just say on that, the slave trade is one of the ways that they do that. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the ways that they contend with, um, that they contend with with the enslaved population that they that they try to continue to repress the enslaved population is through the ability to buy and sell them um yes. you know if you're in if you're in a part of the confederacy or a part of the south that's exposed uh the easiest way to suppress enslaved freedom aspirations is to move them somewhere else um and the domestic slave trade allows people to do that um you know uh i would say um while you know, while while I take sort of Freeling's larger point about the the sort of the divisions between um, the upper and lower upper and middle and lower Souths mm-hmm. and the the sort of the the distinctions between the border states and and, and of course I, you know I think he's exactly right on you know sort of the critical nature of the border states remaining in the Union for the outcome of the Civil War um, I think that's absolutely essential. Um, what I what I would say in some ways is that the slave trade is 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 more a unifying factor mm. than it is anything else. Yeah, sure, um, yeah. In this in the sense that it it, it sort of gives a sh- it, it continues to provide a shared um, financial incentive in the survival mm. of the Confederacy. Mm. Um, it allows people in in the border states to some degree, but also in exposed regions to. Uh, maintain links with mm-hmm. the confederacy or it's, or it's one of the links that they continue to maintain with the confederate government and um you know one of, one of the things i have not been able to determine in my research is is who precisely is buying enslaved people during mm-hmm. the war that is to say um that is to say i have i i, I can't demonstrate in any sort of quantitative way that, for example, uh, people who had not been slaveholders before the war are taking the opportunity of the conflict to acquire people. Mm-hmm. Though I would say that certainly does happen in in individual cases. There is a, um, 
the there is a a delegate to the Virginia secession convention during the war whose mm-hmm. wife right or during I'm sorry during during the secession crisis obviously um and his wife writes to him and says essentially like you should take this opportunity to buy us uh, an enslaved person who mm-hmm. would be the first person that they would have owned um mm-hmm. by the same token there is there certainly is class conflict um Sam Watkins says that uh there was an uptick in slave purchases to um, bring people into compliance with uh, you know, the, the so-called quote unquote 20 Negro law. Right. Um, I have seen sort of limited evidence that that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I haven't, I, I, I've not seen, I've seen maybe one document that is explicitly along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it, what does does this speak to sort of class divisions, internal divisions within the South? Uh, probably in some ways, but I, I tend to see the slave trade as much more evidence of sort of a persistent Confederate nationalism. Okay, no, good. The other parts of when you said class conflicts, I was going to follow up with the um, substitutes, right? That mm-hmm. person yes. is like, yes, oh, I'm going to sell a slave. That way I get some money, I can buy a substitute mm-hmm. and I I don't need to go to war. Yes. So it's 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 sort of like it's it's perverted on, on so many levels where it's like mm-hmm. so in part you're slave you're enslaving people. You obviously want this project to succeed because you want to keep the investment, but you're not willing right. to fight for it and you're willing to sell people to avoid fighting mm-hmm. for. <laughs> mm-hmm. and send somebody else to fight for you <laughs> right it yeah it is and and i one of the that was one of the things that struck me as i was you know working through the archives is i i found a significant number of examples of slaveholders either trying to or succeeding in exchange fun- functionally exchanging pe- uh, people yeah to get out of the military service um yeah i mean it's it's, it's and, an exchange of people right <laughs> It is. Well, in some cases, it literally is uh, yeah. because um, I'll give you a slave as you the war goes. Me. Yes, uh, exactly. So as, as the war goes on, um, you know, substitutes are 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 no more um, eager to take on Confederate money than anybody else is. Well, yeah. But what they will take is an enslaved person. Yeah. Um, uh, and and I and you know I again I would have to I would have to do a different kind of digging than I did uh, for this project to see. You know, are these cases in which a person is acquiring their first enslaved labor? But it certainly seems plausible to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there is, there is, there. Are, you know, I found multiple, multiple moments, multiple pieces of evidence where people say, in some cases explicitly, "Look, look, I won't take money, mm-hmm. but I, I will take a person," um, yeah. which is, you know, pretty, pretty, a pretty, yeah, as you say, perverse uh, yeah. way of looking at this. Of course, in the end, you're a dumb guy because you spend a year or two fighting and then you lose the pay that you were getting for right. that fight in the enslaved right. person that now goes free. So, like, right. You, you're like, I mean, this, the, the big slave owners that paid you in a slave is still dumb by too because he loses war, but you, you too are losing. Right. Like, it, right. No win situation right. there for. For the white population, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that was one of the other questions I really wanted was curious about because I I wondered I kind of, I want to get your sense of it. Could we use the slave trade as sort of a indicator of the like? use confederate nationalism kind of the backing mm-hmm. of confederate nationalism kind of morale amongst confederates in that like not probably universally for the entirety of the southern population but for a large chunk of this mm-hmm. population can we use the slave trade like mm-hmm. the ups and downs in it as sort of gauge to kind of say how how committed are people how much are they believing yeah. this will be successful so I would say I would say yes, uh, with the caveat that it's really difficult to quantify, um, yeah. and that um, you know I think especially in the last year of the war, the the Confederate economic breakdown is such that um, it's it's very difficult to get a clear picture of what's happening. 
Um, uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I saw, I'll give you, I'll give you the, just the, the just again, to, this is probably just in terms of caveats. Um, mm-hmm. For example, it becomes very difficult to buy enslaved people in the spring of 1864 because the Confederacy makes its sort of last ditch effort to overhaul their currency problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've seen multiple pieces of evidence basically saying, like, it's impossible to buy or sell anything. So in that context, I would say, does that give us a good sense of Confederate? Can we can we use it effectively in that context? I'm not I, maybe I'm not so sure. Um, certainly what you can use is people saying, boy, I'd really like to buy an enslaved person. Uh, right. Um but yes, I and, and but I, but I think generally speaking, I think I think I think that's absolutely correct. Um, and uh, the the only other person who's really written on this at all is Jamie Martinez, and that's an argument she advances in um, a chapter she wrote uh, a, a while ago. Um, mm-hmm. What I would say, uh, what I would add to that is that so it's, uh, well, for example, yeah, the 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 slave trade experience is a significant and and demonstrable uptick. Uh, in the summer of 1862, when Confederate fortunes rebound following the Seven Days Battles, Second Manassas, the Antietam campaign, and so forth. Um, and people people reference this repeatedly. It's very clear that the, the Richmond slave market particularly right. slowed down heading into the Seven Days. Not surprising, the Union Army yeah. is six miles from the city. Um, but as soon as the Union Army is gone, the slave trade takes off again. Mm-hmm. Um the other thing I the other thing I would say to this is that Confederates make this comparison um mm. all the time. Uh there are articles in newspapers with regularity talking about the prices obtained at various slave sales throughout the South. And they explicitly make that connection. They say, look, this shows that we're confident we're going to win. This shows that we're if if we weren't confident, would slave prices be as high as they are? Now, northern papers report on this and say, you do understand how inflation works, right? <laughs> um but no, I you don't know, think I, they I, do. <laughs> no, well, I think they do, but you know, it's it's there's a sort of whistling past the graveyard yeah. sort of um there's a there's a moment in Ed, Edmund Ruffin writes in his diary in the fall of 1862. He says something to the effect of like slave prices are really high. I know most of it is, and he's a, and I'm paraphrasing him, right? Yeah. But he says I most of this is definitely inflation, but prices are still higher. And he, his phrase is something to the effect of than any return that enslaved labor could bring you, oh. which says to me that there's an underlying confidence in slavery that's sort of baked in there. Um, And he says this, he he mentions this, this is, I think I want to say October 62. Um, He mentions this in explicit connection to the preliminary emancipation proclamation. And he says this had the preliminary emancipation proclamation Ruffin says, and, and he's not the only one who says this did absolutely nothing to, to the slave market. Um, because they're confident they're going to win. And that, yeah. that that sort of mentality certainly persists throughout the war. Right. I mean, that's a big failure of the Emancipation Proclamation, right? That's like what mm-hmm. the kind of initial goal of the preliminary one being brings the country back together. It's just that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're committed yeah. to that independence by this stage. Right. right. So, yeah, I can totally see that, that being a point. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, as we're kind of drawing towards the end here, I wanted to briefly talk about something else too, and that sort of, uh, you you're working at the Center for Civil Research, which is like the brains of John Neff, um, and mm-hmm. sort of the idea of civil war memory. So I I, I, mm-hmm. I kind of was, I guess, sort of on the lookout for somewhat memory related things in your book, mm-hmm. and I was very struck by. Um, actually, let's start with with Silas. Um, I'm probably going to butcher his name here, Omohandro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because when I read that, I was like, "Wait a minute, Omohandro is that that's that big early America Institute at William and Mary? Why would you name a place after a major enslaver?" 
Mm -hmm. And um, so is there any conversation or are they kind of whitewash yeah. kind of going like, we're good because no, um, we got that big donation from them and they're... No. Um, so so the, the Omahundra Institute has been very upfront about... Um, yes. So the connection is, it's not... So there's no evidence that there's a direct connection to Silas Omahundro, financially speaking. Okay. Um, the money, the money comes uh, from came from his great nephew, I believe. Uh, so not someone who, as far as they know or we know, inherited his money um, uh, from from Silas Omahundro. Um, uh, I was, I was, you know, when I, I, to the best of my recollection, he made most of his money in sort of the during the New Deal. Um, okay. uh, the donor's name is Malvern Hill Omahundro, which is probably a story in and of itself. Um, but uh, yeah, but the, but they've been very upfront about that, um, yeah. and um, you know, Karen Wolf has written about the sort of the you know the need to highlight this that there is a connection, there's a familial connection. Um, right. it's just unclear whether there's a financial one. Um, right. and, uh, I mentioned, I mentioned Alexandra Finley, uh, who's written on, who's probably the person who's written the most on Silas Omahundro, um, and his, the enslaved woman he considered his wife, Corinna. Uh, and she is, she's written a great deal about this as well. And she actually, you know, she was, she did her grad work at William and Mary. So she was kind of ground, ground zero on these conversations, I think. No, it, um, it's, but no, it, it, but you think of like those things where it's like with all the kind of publicity that sometimes comes out in our new age mm -hmm. of social media and mm -hmm. like, oh, I have 200 characters and I'm going to trash something right. because I think there's right. a connection. You know, it's like, right. it's so easy to to jump to those where like, oh, there's no Mahondro and they name, mm -hmm. like, oh, they shouldn't do that. Like, they, the nuance yeah. is oftentimes I, missed in those kinds of conversations. No, it, it definitely is. Um, what I think, what, what, what is almost interesting, right, is it, I think in some ways is is interesting in this regard is that there is very little there's uh, until relatively recently, there's very little um, sort of mainstream public memory of the slave trade period. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in the African-American community, there is. But sort of in the That's in the broader um, in the broader uh, culture, cert certainly and to the degree that there's memory of the slave trade, it's predominantly, I think the public memory is predominantly focused on the Atlantic slave trade. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, th there's sort of a, a growing effort to commemorate um, mm -hmm. the domestic slave trade. Uh, there, there is the preservation of a few sites. Um, yeah. uh, the foundation of Robert Lumpkin's slave jail in Richmond, for example, mm -hmm. Richmond has a, has a really excellent slave trail that takes you through many yeah. of these sites. Um but part of the part of the issue, uh, and of course, there's the, the what's now the Freedom House Museum in Alexandria, the, the remnants of Franklin and Armfield's complex, which was active into the Civil War um, or about a day and a half into the Civil War. But that's um, it's uh, a day and a half. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and it's it's an interest, really interesting sort of um, place where you have uh, the slave jail that Union soldiers occupy literally the day after Virginia secedes, liberate the people held there, um, one of whom becomes a member of the United States Colored Troops, um, but, which is then used to hold a combination of Confederate prisoners and Union prisoners complex is also a hospital for freed people during the civil war. So it's a really complex site. Um, the challenge is in many ways, the mo many of the, with the, with, again, and with the exception of the, the old slave mart museum in Charleston, which has its own history. Um, a lot of these sites are simply gone um, or they, they've been, they've been paved over. Um, mm -hmm. The, I, I talk a lot in the book about the, the slave trading firm of Dickinson Hill and company. Um, in Richmond, which is, I talk about them a lot because they, they have the best surviving records. Well, the spot where their offices were is a parking lot in downtown Richmond. And, you know, you would never, you would never know unless you were, unless you were looking for it. Um, yeah. Same with, uh, I was just in New Orleans for the OAH conference. Uh, Franklin and Armfield's offices in New Orleans are, are a parking lot um, yeah. now. Uh so you know the the there there is relatively little um 
in some ways there's relatively little memory, physical memory to seize onto. On the other hand, I'm not sure how hard people have looked. Um, and, and the reality is that, um, if you were looking for the largest slave trading sites in the country, you would go to county courthouses. Um, right. Right. Uh, uh, Thomas Russell has written a great deal on this. Um, Ann Bailey had a great sort of photo es- uh, essay accompanied by photographs a few years ago in the New York Times, I think. Um, and so that's the, it's kind of, you know, so I, I mean, so um, and it's part and parcel of sort of larger efforts to remember. So I, I live in, in, in Lafayette County, Mississippi. Um, I'm probably a mile from the county courthouse right now. And to 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 their credit, there are monuments or there are markers to to lynchings mm-hmm. that took place in the county. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no commemoration at the courthouse of uh, the slave sales that mm-hmm. certainly took place there. Um, mm-hmm. Will we get there? Hopefully, eventually. I, I hope so. But um, mm-hmm. I'm I think it's the kind of thing that slides under the radar yeah. uh, altogether well, it was too much. Just fascinated when you wrote in the books that it's like I think it was the one in Alexandria is that it's it's opened and you immediately as tourists people go to this to kind of see oh it, yeah you know it's that yes. that's it there was yes. an interest so it's like like eventually it mm-hmm. just disappears mm-hmm. and we kind of yeah lose that. it's yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where I, and i think a lot of it has to do with well i mean i'm speculating a bit here um you know, there, there's a whole sort of debate over the the social position of slave traders in the antebellum South. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that they were universally despised is, is patently false. Um, mm-hmm. Nathaniel B. Hill, uh, a member of Nick, uh, Dickinson Hill and Company, sits on the Richmond City Council for most of the 1850s and into the Civil War. So, right. <laughs> um, and and he's and he's not the only person who holds political office in the city um, mm-hmm. and is also a slave trader. Um, but uh, what I would say is that, you know, in terms of memory, they they don't occupy the same sort of public prominence that, say, Confederate generals do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it matters that uh, many of the people who might have been sort of the uh, most notorious slave traders, many of them died during the war or shortly thereafter. Um, Silas Omohundro dies during the war, Hector Davis, Robert Lumpkin dies like a year after the war. Um, and um, so it, it becomes, and, and many of the other ones sort of withdraw from, from public okay. life. Um, so I think that, I think that, that shapes the memory as well, that these yeah. people, uh, no one, you know, I, there, there are almost no images of these men there are a handful but there's almost no images of them mm. and that's because i think that they're they want you know, to they, land as a radar kind of yeah or or you know or they just have right um yeah. and um so uh they're then their mm. their records are another story um i've right. written a bit about that elsewhere um uh and so I think that all of that sort of aids aids the forgetting of the slave trade. Um, former Confederates certainly don't want to talk about it. That's yeah. part of it as well. Well, yeah. Um, and well, yeah, right. And 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 the slave trade is minimized by generations of historians as well. Yeah. Um, and so all of it's that sort of comes together. Warfare. Yeah. Or yes. Or you know. Or this. You know. If you're um, Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman thought it wasn't that big. Uh, right, Eugene right, Genovese right. barely talks about it in Roll Jordan mm-hmm. Roll, um, and so it you know it doesn't really gain a prominence in the academic mainstream with with a few exceptions until the 1990s. Right. Yeah, yeah, but then it's way oh. too late. But it's it's sort of funny when you think of it, like it's so easy where that parking lot is you can put up a marker mm-hmm. you can put up a marker. which which it's... again rich richmond has uh yeah. in, in some cities cities in, but then I mean, how many just... people look at the marker that's next right. to the parking well, lot that's right um yeah and and so but you know there are there are more of these richmond has one so, you know richmond savannah alexandria yeah. washington dc they're working uh, there, there are there are markers right some of these places are marked but yeah. you know the reality is that very little of the very there are very few physical remains survive yeah. and i think that that does a lot to shape how yeah. 
in, in contrast to say, um, I mean, I know you you've done tours in the in, of plantation houses throughout the South. There are, there are any yeah. number of plantation houses that survive. Exactly. But because the but I think part probably in large part also because these sort of major slave trading facilities are in urban areas and urban mm-hmm. areas have undergone so many evolutions. Um, mm-hmm. I think that serves to do a lot to hide it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's a great public history project right there. It really would be. Um, I mean, it, it really, and again, not to discount the, the great work that people are doing, but um, there, there's any amount of, of sort of public memory work left to be done. Yeah, no. And just also thinking beyond, right? Outside the box of mm-hmm. like, don't think of like things that you don't usually have in your mind, like the slave trade as a mm-hmm. aspect in your community of, where did it take place? Like, how could mm-hmm. we talk about that, right? And mm-hmm. like you said, like in every courthouse in the country, like there's there's hundreds of places now where you could go and talk mm-hmm. about your book. That's right. So, too many, too, too many. many. <laughs> uh, but with that, I think we're we kind of covered and gave people hopefully a good sense of your book. And yeah, we I hope can... I, I think so. This it's been great. Yeah, so with that, um, I guess I should ask, what's the bet that you win the Willie Silver Prize? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not in the running for that prize, though. I will. I will say so. Uh, the I will. I'll plug it here because many of your listeners Go may ahead. be eligible. Um, I, I'm I'm the associate director of the Center for Civil War Research at the University of Mississippi, and we offer an annual book prize for the best first book in Civil War history. So if you have uh, <laughs> You, if if you in 2024 are publishing your first book and your book is about the Civil War in some way, shape, or form, uh, please um, submit to us. Encourage your press to submit books to us. Um, it's it's a it's a great prize, and it's um you know it's uh, it's a little more niche than some of the other large ones in the field. So, and it, it's a great one, particularly for for um, emerging scholars in the field. Amen to that. <laughs> and. Uh... Great conference you usually have as well. Mm-hmm. As yeah, we'll, we'll we'll be holding another one in twenty twenty five. So be on the lookout for uh, conf- uh call yeah. for papers or or other materials. There we go. Got the Civil Research so Center for Civil Research in a little bit more. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, if you're interested in Robert's book after this conversation, it's the it's <clears throat> get this right. It is. An Unholy Traffic, Slave Trading in the Civil War South by Oxford University Press. So go out and get it. Um, again, greatly appreciate your time today, Robert. Um, I hope you have a great weekend and um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Niels. Same to you. <laughs>